Hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm Khalil. I'm the manager with Battle River Research Group. Uh, I hope you are doing, doing very well during this uh, interesting times. Uh, so today, the speaker of our webinar, uh, his name is Barry Yarimcio. He is well known throughout the province. When I'm talking to anybody who's related to egg industry, government people, egg service boards, consultants, colleges, even universities, you name it, everybody knows him. He was working with uh, Alberta government as a beef and forage specialist. And currently he's running his own consultancy company, Yaramcio Egg Consulting Limited. So before moving forward to the webinar, I just wanted to mention two things. Uh, this one is a listen only webinar. And the second thing, uh, you have a chat uh, room in your right side. If you have any questions uh, during the webinar, you can type in and Barry gonna answer them uh, during the presentation or maybe, maybe in the end of the webinar as well. So in the end, I'm really thankful to Panther County to sponsor this webinar. So welcome Barry, you can start uh, your presentation now. Thank you, Khalil. What I would like you to do for me is, I don't know if I'm going to be able to see the uh, chat or the questions coming in. So if you can see them on your screen, please let me know and interrupt so we can answer them as we're going along. Um, this is my uh, inaugural, uh, let me put it another way. This is the first event that I've uh, put on as a private consultant after the Ag Info Center was closed here in the middle of March. So hopefully we'll do the same thing that I did for the last 17 years and, and we'll have some continuity of service in some way. So what I'd like to cover today is how does the nutrient requirements from, a, from an animal change from pregnancy to lactation? And I've thrown in a few other slides in there as how do you prepare an animal to be in good condition and be ready to transition from pregnancy to lactation, all the way from being a replacement heifer, uh, development into that first calf heifer, and then on to uh, subsequent lactations. How has the year, uh, the last growing year in 2019 impacted our forage qualities compared to a five-year average? And how do we have to adjust our feeding programs to, make, to compensate for the lower protein and lower energy contents? So we need to adjust the feeding programs. How do we make it a successful calving season? And then get into what's important in a feed test. There's been a lot of different things added to the feed tests over the last 20 to 30 years. Some of them make sense and to me other ones are just confusing uh, and don't need to be used. I don't have much on spring thrash grains as far as literature goes, but I'm gonna rely on uh, experience over the last 35 years as to what I've seen. So when we look at developing the replacement heifer, uh, work done down in Montana back in the mid 80s, uh, was with heifers uh, being fed separately and those that are being fed together. And these are the starting weights. That would be the actual weaning weights. And you got to remember that the mature cow in Montana back in the mid 80s was only someplace between 900 and 1,000 pounds. So they were very small animals. Don't get hung up on the actual weights that are there, but pay attention to what happens when uh, there's different management techniques used to get these animals ready for breeding. So what they did was they split the herd into four, uh, into two segments, the ones that were heavy and the ones that were light. And then they split those groups in half again so that they, one group, uh, they fed the heavy and the lightweights together and then for the other half, they split those animals into two groups, the heavy and the light. So they were feeding them separately. 
And what they wanted to do was have a final weight of someplace in that 670 to 690 pounds. With those animals that were fed together with an ex expected or, or predicted average daily gain, you can see that the heavy animals, the ones that had more access to the trough and got more than their share of feed, were gaining a little bit more than what they actually required. With the lightweight animals, they did not get anywhere near the weight gains that they needed, and that did have an impact in their overall performance, and we'll see that in the next couple slides. But breaking those animals down into separate pens and feeding them to according to what they needed really worked well. The heavier weight animals that started separately, they were able to feed a little bit less grain, a little bit more forage, and they actually got a little bit more average daily gain than what they needed, but they were right on target. For the lightweight animals, they wanted 1.7 pounds a gain, and they actually got 1.8. .8. So having a little bit less competition and providing the ration with either more grain or less grain, uh, a little more protein, they were able to get exactly what they needed for growth rates when they were fed separately. So carrying these animals on, you can see that the animals that were fed together, the lighter animals took a look about, took about 20 days longer to start uh, reaching puberty. And with the lightweight animals that were fed together, only 60% of those were uh, cycling at the start of, uh, of br the breeding season. Thus, a 60% pregnancy rate when those animals were fed together. When they were fed separately, there was no impact on the age of puberty per se for the heavyweight animals versus those fed together, but the lightweight calves uh, did come into heat a lot quicker, had a 20 per, uh, to almost a 20% higher percentage points of those animals being cycling at the start of the breeding season, and therefore 20% higher conception rate in pregnant animals uh, as first calf heifers. Now, heifers themselves have to be treated with a little bit of respect because if you're pushing them too hard during puberty, what'll happen is the mammary gland is growing four times faster than any other tissue. And what'll happen then is instead of the bag filling up with milk secreting tissue, there's, they're going to fill up with fat. And once that space is taken up with fat, there is no chance later in life for that fat to disappear and increase the amount of milk screening tissue. So you're stuck, whatever you have for capability at puberty during that developmental period is what you're gonna have for life. For the smaller traditional type animals in that 13, 1400 pound mature weight, weight gains 1.5 to 1.75 pounds a day is your, is your uh, projected, what you're targeting. If you're looking at a Simmental or a Charlet at 1,800 pounds, you could probably bring that upper limit up to two pounds a day. Now, <coughs> some of the newer work that's out is suggesting that instead of getting these animals up to that 1.5, 1.7 pounds a day during the early stages of development, let them stay at about a pound to a pound and a quarter. So basically a straight forage ration and then the last 60 days prior to turnout to the bull, give them the grain so that they do get that 1.75 pounds a day gain. That flushing seems to improve the uh, conception rates as well. So if we're looking at a 1400 pound cow on average, during late pregnancy and after calving, there is a substantial difference in the amount of protein and energy that's required uh, roughly a 20 to 25 percent increase in those nutrients to support the animal during lactation so that she doesn't lose weight, can optimize milk production, and be ready for the bull. The biggest change after calving is when they're producing that 20 pounds of milk a day. The increase in calcium goes uh, is dramatic and the extra calcium is needed to support that milk production and prevent downer cows and milk fevers and, and uh, winter tetany problems. Phosphorus again goes up and uh, 
we'll get into that a little bit later for what the phosphorus actually does. Now, what we saw this year is the quality of the forage is down considerably. And for this presentation, I'm using these numbers as my uh, references to how we develop the late pregnancy cow ration and the lactating cow ration. So the big thing is, in order to do a good job, you need to have your feed test results done and uh, monitor cow condition and what's actually going into them. So proteins down with the alfalfa grass hay, and a lot of that's got to do with the lack of sunshine, cooler temperature, uh, the photosynthesis wasn't driving as fast as it, as it should have been, therefore the lower quality. And the other thing that you can see with this one is the acid detergent fiber went up from 36 to 48%. The second reason for this hay being lower quality this year is cutting was delayed, either intentionally to increase the volume of hay that you were getting, or in some cases, Mother Nature just didn't allow you to get out in the field with 30 inches of rain in some areas, and other areas, you know, having showers every two or three days, leaving the crop stand so it didn't get blackened and, and loss of quality that way. NDF fiber levels go up. I'll explain that one a little bit as well, but it, ADF or acid detergent fiber and neutral detergent fiber are in lockstep with each other. So this makes sense. The older the, the forage, the higher the, the fiber content. And conversely, when fiber levels go up, your energy levels go down. So you can see a 10 point drop in energy content overall. So with the late pregnancy ration, or any ration in fact, if you get an NDF content over 60% in the final ration, feed intake is restricted. So on using cow bites, the calculation is uh, a cow of 1,400 pounds should be able to eat roughly 30 and a half pounds of dry matter per day of, of hay and, and feed, dry feed. But with the high NDF content, the intake is limited to 26, po uh, 26 pounds per day. Now, if nothing else is doing, being done to offset that loss of feed intake, the lo lower energy intake, lower protein intake could potentially cause a two pound a day uh, reduction in weight when temperatures are at minus 20 degrees Celsius. The feed, hay alone is also deficient in phosphorus and magnesium, and that affects me energy metabolism and efficiency of that energy use as well. So to, a, to compensate for the lack of energy and the lack of protein in the ration, the recommendation is reduce your feed, uh, hay provided to 25 pounds per head per day as fed. Add seven pounds of barley or eight pounds of oats to meet energy requirements. And that's down to minus 20. If it gets colder than that, if it's minus 30, you need to add two additional pounds of grain over and above what is normally fed. At minus 40, you need to add four pounds of extra grain. Adding nine grams of magnesium oxide is needed to prevent the tetany or downer cow sim symptoms or problems in, in, pre in pregnancy. Use a good fortified trace mineral salt with selenium year round, especially so during the last trimester of pregnancy because that's when 75% of the calf growth occurs, <coughs> pardon me, and you're also going to need your vitamin A, D, and E. And most of the vitamin A, D, and E products do not have enough vitamin E to uh, meet requirements of 300 IUs a day pre calving. So it's not unusual to uh, add an additional five or six grams of vitamin E 50,000 at this point in time. Now, I mentioned in the previous screen that the phosphorus and magnesium contents are low in the hay. Barley grain, oats grain, triticale, distillers grains, any of the byproducts also have high phosphorus content. So that's why I'm not adding a one-to-one -one mineral in this situation. The phosphorus is being provided by the grain. So why are these changes needed? Phosphorus is a driver of all metabolic functions from getting the energy out of the feed 
to uh, nerve impulse transmission, muscle functions. Uh, everything is related to phosphorus. It's needed for growth, reproductive efficiency, and immunity. And some of these things you're going to see a reoccurring uh, commonality between some of the different uh, nutrients, but they all work together to do a proper job. Magnesium is a uh, coenzyme that is needed to extract the energy from the feed, makes the extraction more efficient. It's also needed to prevent downer cows, milk fevers, and tetany problems. Now, downer cows, and thanks to Murray Feist for this slide from Saskatchewan Agriculture, a uh, high potassium and sodium content in a forage compared to sulfur and chlorine uh, will uh, is a way to evaluate the feed. So you, what you do is you take your uh, mill equivalents of the potassium and sodium divided by the combined values for sulfur and chloride. And what you want to do is have a more acidic condition, pH 5, 5.5, five to have a better release of the calcium from the feed and, and the bone. So if you've got a very high potassium content, more commonly occurring in a straight alfalfa, or if you're using kochia or feeds that are grown on highly saline areas, there is a potential for high potassium levels. This is when you can have problems with the downer cows. So be careful with this. Uh, Usually this is something that you calculate out using cow bites or you're talking to a nutritionist and they can do the hard work for you. Vitamin side of things, vitamin A, appetite, growth, important for both uh, functionality of the male and female systems for reproduction. And the big one is immune function. What vitamin A is responsible for is maintaining this, the integrity of the cell walls in the tissues so that they function properly. Now, if you don't have enough vitamin A, and we're seeing a lot of this this year because many of the forages this year were put up as silages rather than as hay. So all the vitamin precursors are destroyed during the fermentation process. So, and uh, what you can see then is abortions dead calves at birth, poor weight gains, diarrhea, and pneumonia. And typically, the uh, one thing that is common with all of these uh, vitamin deficiencies is the calves just are a bit more lethargic and do not have the power to really get going and suck within the first 30 minutes after birth. Vitamin D, appetite, swollen joints, uh, when you get appetite, you also are impacting growth, respiratory problems, and here the big one is stillborn or weak calves at birth. Vitamin E, the big one that is typically deficient in uh, the vitamin A, D, E premixes, there, there's not enough in them to make meet requirements. The feed companies, when you're buying a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one or even a uh, 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 swath grazing type mineral, they're getting better at increasing the amount of vitamin E in these products, but immunity is the big thing. It, uh, vitamin E is part of, uh, the only way the calf gets vitamin E is through the colostrum, so you need to supplement your vitamin E at least three months ahead of calving. That would be the absolute minimum because colostrum is formed four to six weeks prior to calving, and if the cow is short of uh, vitamin E, it's not going to put it into the, into the colostrum. It's needed for improving growth rates. You also need the selenium levels to, and with the vitamin E because that's like a pulley and belt. And uh, they need to work together. Both of these are extremely important for maintaining a high level of reproductive efficiency. Colostrum management from Dr. Homerowski. I, I snuck this slide from her. You want to have these calves drinking two liters of colostrum by four hours of age. As time goes on, the rumen wall closes up and the large proteins that, are, that make up the immunoglobulins, they uh, are permitted to pass very quickly. But by the time the animal is eight to 12 hours old, 
a lot of these immunoglobulins are too big to pass. So why is pre-calving important? I'm going to talk a little bit on body condition scoring and performance. Again, some work done out of uh, Mile High uh, Beef Center in Montana. The big thing is when they were when you were they broke the animals into a high and low feeding period. The high period, high fed animals got three to four pounds of grain a day prior to calving. You can see with the calf birth weights, really no difference when that extra energy was provided to the heifers compared to the cow birth weights, but. The heifers that did not get that extra energy, they're still growing themselves. So they try to meet their mark target weight of 85% of mature weight by the time they calf. Therefore, the calf is not getting the groceries that they need. I can stand a smaller calf as long as it's healthy and, and ready to go. But the big differential is you had 60% of the heifers needing assistance during calving or you know have the calves pulled. And I'm sorry, I got better things to do with my time than pull calves all afternoon. Now, what does that pre-feeding of a little bit of extra grain have to do with the performance of these first calf heifers or the cows themselves? You can see that the animals that uh, had that little bit of extra grain were about 90 pounds heavier. And uh, Days to estrus, they had 20 days less to uh, get the reproductive system back into shape. And they had a 20% higher conception rate compared to the animals that did not get that extra grain pre-calving. Now, body condition scoring is something that can be used on the farm to uh, check on the, on the condition of the cows. This is a hands-on technique where you uh, run your thumb across the short ribs and uh, the uh, hip bone tail head and the sharper the bone is the less fat that they're carrying the less condition they're, they're, they're less condition they have and that reduces their weight they don't have that surplus uh, fat underneath the uh, hide to provide insulation or to be mobilized as fat to provide extra energy during that early part of lactation. So what you want to do is if you're conditioning your, conditioning your cows, and you don't have to do them all, 5-10% of the herd if you want to do that just to get an idea where you're at, you want your cows to be in a condition score of 3.5, 3 to 3.5 going into winter and 3 at calving. So the spinal process there are short ribs, the bone should be, should not be sharp to the touch and should feel a little bit of an indentation between the four short ribs. So it's not flush or flat. If the cow is too fat, you're really gonna have to apply a lot of pressure with the thumb to, uh, to feel the short rib and you're overfeeding. You're always working off the right hand side of the animal when you're looking at her from the back end. If you work on the left hand side, that's where the rumen is it's gonna give you a false reading. So an animal that is in poor condition or a one condition score light going into winter is roughly 200 pounds lighter than what she should be. And that's gonna need an extra 1400 pounds of hay just to keep warm. Condition score will impact your colostrum. The system that's being used in Canada is a one to nine system. And then for the US, or excuse me, the Canada system is one to five and the US system is one to nine. So this, we're using the US system for this slide. So the six that we have shown on this slide is equivalent to a three for the Canadian system. Look at the difference in the amount of immunoglobulin that you had between the two, between an animal that is 150 or no, um, 300 pounds light compared to where she should be. Your colostrum IgM, the short-term immunity, if you've got problems with calves beginning sick within two, three, four days of being born, if those cows are thin, they don't have the colostrum quality uh, for the short-term immunoglobulins. Long-term, not much of a problem. That's when you see troubles at three, four, five months of age. For milk yield, 
<coughs> excuse me. In early lactation, you can see at roughly seven, eight weeks of, of after calving or eight weeks of lactation, that's when the peak occurs. If you do not have the ability to, uh, or let me try again, it's difficult for cows, especially young heifers and, and the more timid cows to get enough feed to meet their energy requirement. So if they've got good condition, they can draw fat off their back to produce milk. So one pound of, of uh, fat produces seven pounds of milk and basically seven pounds of milk at this stage of production will put on a pound of gain on a calf. A maximum feed intake occurs at, at, at roughly 12 to 15 weeks of eight uh, after calving. So whatever you can do to get that maximum peak lactation occurring, it helps you in the long run because it's not that you're just flattening off that peak. If you're losing two pounds a day at the peak lactation, you're gonna lose an incremental amount all the way through till that calf is weaned. So it's a large amount of re, uh, energy that uh, the calf is not receiving and therefore it's not gonna gain as well. Cows returning to heat. You can see that the thin cows, uh, only 40%, 46% were cycling at uh, 60 days pre -calv or post calving. 61% for the moderate and 91% are in good condition. So if you can have that cow cycling one heat cycle prior to the turnout of the bull, your first service conception rates will probably be 20% higher. So anything you can do to get that energy into them and prevent the weight loss, it's gonna help you in the long run. Uh, Bergen McElroy at the U of Alberta, University of Alberta back in the 60s did the work. And when they had a weight gain loss, like 1964, 65, uh, calf crop the next year, reproductive efficiency drops substantially. Even a slight weight gain, 65, 66, nine pounds of gain between calving and bull turnout, you can see that it maintained uh, high levels of reproductive efficiency. So it doesn't take much to improve it. And then 66, 67, it doesn't take much for those levels to drop again. Salt and mineral supplementation. A loose product is consumed at a higher rate than blocks during the winter, about 25% higher. And think about it, when it's minus 20, a cow licking on a block of salt is no different than uh, you going over to the John Deere and licking the fender. If you are having troubles getting enough salt and mineral consumption at night, or enough consumption of, of the salt and mineral, 75% of the consumption occurs at night. Place a salt station in the loafing areas. Cows wake up, they walk around, they want to do something to go and eat some salt. Rough rule of thumb, 100 cows should consume one bag of salt per week. Uh, if you're looking at a mineral product that's being consumed at 100 grams per head per day, 250 cows should consume a bag of mineral in a day. You want to mix the salt and mineral together if you're mixing it at home. Cows have a craving for salt. They have no idea what mineral is. As far as requirements, they just know that they need so much salt and they will eat until that is met. The other thing you can do if you're not getting enough consumption is add some econoless or dried molasses, six, seven percent by weight to improve intake and adjust the amount of dried molasses so that you get the consumption that you need. Force-fed is always better than free choice. Sometimes there's no, ch no choice in the matter, but this is Rob Hand's work from 1996 up in the Westlock area where on pasture, he found that it was almost five days between visits for cows coming to the salt station and their intake ranged from one gram to 774 grams a day. That's 1.6 pounds. <coughs> Calves are even worse. They'll go up to 2.3 pounds a day for voluntary consumption. So when we're building a post-calving ration, we talked about the late pregnancy cow at 9%, protein 60% TDN. After calving, that goes up to 11 and 65%. So 
using that poor quality hay, we drop it down to 23 pounds. Instead of seven pounds of grain of barley, you're looking at 14. There's not enough protein in there, so you need about a pound and a half of canola meal, a pound of distiller's grains, two pounds of peas as options, along with your magnesium oxide, salt, and the vitamins. <laughs> The big ones is your vitamin E requirements increase from 300 to 500 international units per day post calving. To know if your to know if your mineral has the right amount of uh, vitamins or any nutrients, multiply the concentration by the intake to determine what's supplied. So, if the mineral's got 3,000 international units per per kilogram, and they're eating 100 grams or 0.1 kilos, they're getting 300 IU's. I know this is contrary to what the Feed Act says, but with either a vet script or with a customer uh, declaration at a feed mill, you can get products made with higher levels of selenium. And I've been recommending 5.5 to 6.5 milligrams of total selenium a day year round. So it's along with the higher vitamin E, and the higher selenium levels, a lot of the health problems that people encounter or even reproductive problems that they encounter, a lot of them disappear with the better supplementation. Calves <clears throat> are processing grains. Calves under 700 pounds take a long time to chew and eat their grains, so there's no real need to grind or roll cereals. Over 700 pounds, they are no different than a cow. They learn to gulp their food and at that point, the processing is needed. Unprocessed grain for a cow or animals over 700 pounds, someplace in that 12 to 15% reduction in feed efficiency for barley, probably five to 8% for oats. Now, rolled grain should be roughly uh, 65 to 70% of the original bushel weight. If the final weight is too light, you're over-processing and making pig feed. A lot more problems with bloat and acidosis. If your weight is higher than that 70%, your, your processing isn't enough and they're not getting as much out of the feed as they should. Okay, double slide here, folks. Sorry about that. So basically, the picture there gives a good indication for barley. Um, you want to see the roller lines across the kernel. They can appear as if they're whole, but if you roll them between your finger and thumb, they break into two pieces. With a hammer mill, two to three pieces as well. If you're looking at wheat or triticale or rye, only two pieces because their digestive rate is so much faster, there's going to be problems with more chance of uh, problems. So <coughs> we got these animals ready to go. We're talking about all the nutrition, but how do we get to that point? How do we evaluate what's in a feed test report? So two sources of information that I've used in the past is the uh, uh, Beef Cattle Research Council and an AgDEX, Know Your Feed Terms. Uh, I would suggest that you're going to have more success finding the information you need on the Beef Cattle Research Council uh, after they uh, made a lot of changes to roping the web. So to get a good feed sample uh, or an analysis done, use a core sampling tool. You can see that just by sticking your hand into a bale and taking a, a grab sample, you're not getting a representative sample. You're losing a lot of the fine leaves or, and the uh, flowers off the plants. And that's where all the protein, all the energy is. So use a core sampling tool. It'll save you money in the long run. <clears throat> when you do get a, uh, a sample report, or if you once you've submitted, the two first things that I look for is a report number and a lab number. You need that to uh, cross-reference what you've done. The other thing is when uh, you're identifying the sample going to the lab, do something that means to you. Where is it stacked in the yard? Or did it come off of this field? Or did you buy it from Tom? 
uh, have a descriptor there so that you can under, know exactly which stack of hay you're looking at. Now, most of the labs will keep a sample on hand for two to six weeks. I've had samples come back and I went, there's no way that these numbers are right. So I'd reference back to the lab, the report number and the sample number to have it retested at no charge. Now, if you're using, uh, depending on which lab you're using, some of them use wet chemistry and some of them use NIR or near infrared spectrometry for the minerals. <clears throat> Both systems work great for proteins and fibers, but when you look at the mineral side of things, the NIR is out by 200 to 300 percent. It's no point even having a feed test result if you're out that far. So pay the extra 10 bucks, wait an, wait an extra day or two, and get the minerals done by wet chemistry. Then you've got something worthwhile to work with. Moisture content. Uh, moisture in a feed plus the dry matter should equal to 100%. Typically 15 to 17% for hay or green feed. Uh, chop silage, any place from 60 to 70, you don't want to go over 70% in a silage for problems with fermentation and possibility of listeria. Round bales, 22 to 55 or 25 to 55 percent at the lower range you need to use those bales up that year when you're up in that 50 55 percent range as long as the the bales are sealed under plastic they can land for last for two years low for low moisture contents do not allow a full fermentation to occur and those bales will will spoil when it starts warming up in the spring <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little dry here. So how do you compare two different feeds with different moisture contents? <clears throat> Pit silage with 65% moisture and 3.8% protein as fed. How do you compare that against hay? So what we do is we divide the amount of protein by the percentage of dry matter to give us an answer in a dry matter basis. So the barley silage with 3.8% protein is equivalent to 10.85% on a dry matter basis. For the alfalfa with hay, at 16.5% moisture, it brings the protein up to 17%. So that way you can pair apples against oranges instead, or apples against apples at the end of the day, rather than trying to figure out what's actually going on. Now protein supplementation, a lot of different choices and a lot of options out there. Uh, for a feed test report, the important number is the top one, the crude protein. On a dry basis is typically what you're wanting to look at. Acid detergent and soluble crude protein, the second number, ADICP. If you've had heat damage in those bales and they smell like tobacco or uh, are very sweet smelling and brown, that number will go up. The, the forage uh, fibers tie up the available protein, making your available crude pro available protein uh, lower. And with this sample, I'm I basically skipped through the next three numbers: the uh, acid detergent and soluble crude protein as a percent of total protein, solubility protein. Uh, not really that big of a deal for for beef cows. Uh, that's just an indication of how much protein is going to be available to the rumen bacteria. Generally, there's lots of that with most of the forages and uh, grains that we have. The adjusted crude protein, if your heating damage goes up, your adjusted crude protein, that's the number that I would use if you know that you've got damaged feeds. Uh, <clears throat> the labs don't extract or measure protein itself. What they do is they do an extraction no different for nitrogen, no different than they do for soils. Multiply it by 6.25 as a conversion factor to get protein. Now pro proteins needed for growth, lactation, reproduction. It's going to be different based on the type of animal, uh, what stage of production they are. But the other side of the coin is if you're short of protein, 
microbial populations require protein to repopulate. And some of these bacteria only have a lifespan of about 20 minutes. So if you don't have the populations, you're not going to get the digestion and the feed. And we'll touch that a little bit more when we get into neutral detergent fiber. So soluble protein, that's what's readily digested in the rumen. It feeds the mo uh, microbes. Uh, undegradable protein, UIP or bypass protein, uh, that's where it's necessary to get the growth in the calves. If you don't have the bypass protein, it doesn't develop the muscle and also it's needed for the milk proteins as well. So we're, as we're learning more and more about the uh, a bypass protein or undegradable protein for beef cattle, uh, we're getting to realize that it is important. Your, by, your byproducts, your distiller's grains, uh, canola meal, soybean meal, they have a high back bypass protein content if needed. So we're trying to catch up to the dairy industry where they've known that this bypass protein has been very critical. Uh, if you do have heating in the bales, acid detergent and soluble protein, uh, you need that as an additional test. And if you do have the high levels, they'll give you the adjusted crude protein levels. Minerals and trace minerals, we'll touch on this a little bit. Uh, the numbers come out on the test just straight out, and there's no complicating factors in these. But typically what we uh, see is uh, animals in different stages of production have a different requirement. Higher levels of uh, phosphorus and calcium for a young animal that's trying to grow. Uh, but your late pregnancy is, is higher because that animal is at least double the size. And again, you'll see a, an increase that much again into going into lactation. So typically what we'll see is a variability in the calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. They can be all over the place, but typically the copper, manganese, and zinc levels are roughly 40 to 50% of requirements uh, in the forages or in the grains. <laughs> Selenium, very deficient or completely uh, devoid in most areas of Western Canada. There's no point testing them because that's worth three to four hundred dollars a sample and we know it's deficient so you might as well just supplement. Hopefully instead of having to go to a vet script and a uh, uh, customer formulation request, the new feed act they're supposed to be increasing the amount of selenium allowed in a ration to where it needs to be. Cobalt and iodine Again, not, does not occur in Western Canada. Supply 100% of what's required year round. The two, two uh, fibers that I pay attention to are acid detergent fiber and neutral detergent fiber. Uh, depending on uh, when the feed is cut, the higher the fiber levels, the more mature it is. Um, Again, anything over 60% NDF is going to limit intake. The one that there's a lot of consternation on right now is uh, how to estimate the energy content. Non-functional carbohydrate is more for uh, the potential for having a problem with acidosis or bloat. TDN is an energy content based on a formula, and those are undergoing changes uh, as we go along. And sometimes the new equations are better than the old ones, and sometimes they're not. The net energy system or any any NE system or net energy system, lactation, maintenance, and gain, those are just a different system that are being used. Commonly the TDN or digestible energy values are used. Now with acid detergent fiber, estimates the maturity of the fiber of the forage, works good, uh, higher energy, higher fibers, lower energy. NDF is what limits the intake. 1.2% of body weight for neutral detergent consumption limits the intake of the, of the feed. Now, calculated fibers, um, I think we've talked enough about this. 
use the total digestible nutrients or digestible energy system. If you're not sure about these values, um, I know there's charts out there uh, that work very well for Alberta. I've been using them since 1984. Uh, some of these new equations are influenced by a lot of different things. And with the longer daylight hours and cool evenings, we typically have lower fiber contents than what they get out of the States. And a lot of these uh, equations are developed in the Midwest, Kansas uh, area. And that's really a different bird than what we're dealing with up here. Relative feed value and relative feed quality. These are the values on the report. The big thing, relative feed value was originally designed for 100% alfalfa forages. Not really good when it comes to uh, mixtures of grasses and haze. And basically, if you take a look at the ADF, MDF protein, you'll have a better indication of the quality of that forage rather than using relative feed value. Relative feed quality is comparing the different components of NDF. You know, is it lignant? Is it uh, uh, tannins? Or is it something else in that fiber component that makes it harder to uh, digest? Again, uh, something that if you're really keen into it, you can use it, but I don't pay attention to it. Nitrates can occur after drought, hail, frost, herbicide application. All depends on the conditions, the weather, how much moisture, how dry it is. When did you apply for manure or fertilizer? What's the history of the field? Nitrates will peak four days after a light hail or a frost. It'll take them about 10 to 14 days to recover if they do that. And for herbicides, Depends on the product and strength applied. Legumes do not accumulate nitrate, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, I don't have very much information on the spring thrashed grains, but I'll give you what I got and give you a few comments as well. What we typically see with grain that overwinters, some of them will lose bushel weight just because of the loss of soluble carbohydrate and starches. So work that Gary Matheson did at the U of A back in the late 80s found that there was no difference in average daily gain or feed conversion efficiency with barley down to 42 pounds. Below that point, you get a 1% reduction in, in uh, performance for every pound below 42. So the reason I'm mentioning this is you look at a 42 pound barley, if it's going to the elevator or to a feedlot, there's gonna be significant discounts on that grain and especially if it's spring thrashed. They don't like the color, it's hard for them to work it off and sell it to somebody else. So if you've got a neighbor that has the lighter weight grain, the discolored grains, find out what you're gonna have for, a, a, you know, what the elevator is discounting, offer the, the neighbor what the value is of that grain and it could be up to 50, 60 cents a bushel uh, reduction in cost. The one caution I do have with any spring thrashed grains is typically they are very, very dry. Eight, nine, 10% moisture by the time you're able to get in there with a combine. So those grains will be very brittle. They will shatter very quickly. So watch your uh, settings on the rollers. If you're using a hammer mill, you might want to put in an old screen or an old set of hammers. If that doesn't help, slow the tractor down to 1100 RPM so that you don't have that impact to shatter the grain. Concerns that I have with forages or grains is mycotoxins. What I do is I look at four colors, the green, the blue, the red, and the pink. Those molds may have developed mycotoxins, but you need a continuous temperature right around 30 degrees with 70% humidity to produce the mycotoxins. The molds can be present, but if the environmental conditions aren't there, you won't have the mycotoxins uh, present. Now, some labs like to use uh, a test where they go ahead and say, well, you've got so many CFUs or colony forming units 
of a specific type of bacteria. That doesn't tell you anything. You need to ask for the specific mycotoxins to be tested for. And the one that I find that works really well is PDS labs at Saskatoon at the university. They're, they're reasonably priced and they're very good with the information they provide you after the results come out. So a quick, quick touch on this, fusarium vomitoxins, uh, some of that out here this year uh, produces a pinkish white fungal growth, reduces uh, protein synthesis so that your animal's not gonna weight, gain as much weight. The big thing is the first sign of, of you'll get feed refusal, vomiting and diarrhea, especially in pigs and chickens, vomitoxin, therefore, you know, one part per million will cause them to give their feed back. Yearling heifers and cows, they can handle up to 37 parts per million. So if you have experienced the problem with fusarium, do not seed cereals back into that field next year because it does carry over in the trash and in the soil. Two of the mycotoxins in, a, uh, in the fusarium, the T2 and the HT2, uh, it causes damage to the gut of the animal. So when you've got the small intestine, there's a whole bunch of hairs in there to try to absorb the nutrients. That destroys the, the hairs, destroys the linings of those tissues, so they can't absorb the nutrients as well. It reduces the immunity because bone marrow is... Uh, activity is reduced. They can't produce the white blood cells to fight off anything. It's an, uh, both of these mycotoxins are estrogenic. Basically what you're doing is if these are present, you're putting your cows and heifers on uh, birth control pills and it'll take two to three cycles for that to clean itself out. Um, feed refusal is one of the first symptoms uh, because these mycotoxins have a, uh, apparently have a bad taste to the animals and, they, and it causes uh, blisters uh, in the mouths and the animals refuse to eat because they, their mouths are sore. Aspergillus, uh, white mold found on tough or damp grain. It's a common bacteria found in the soil and actinomyces and aspergillus being white common soil bacteria, typically they're a nuisance more than anything else. Penicillium, the blue green mold. Um, if you have eaten uh, blue cheese or Roquefort cheese, that's the same bacteria under controlled conditions, can cause abortions, retain placentas, and also reduce fertility as well. So, I think my time is almost up. <clears throat> so the big thing is, it's not just watching the cows in the last three months or th last three weeks of pregnancy to get them ready for lactation. It's something that has to be done throughout the life cycle of those animals as they go from being a calf into the main herd. And also being careful that you're providing the right amount of nutrients year round there are some ways that if, if you're short of feed and, and you can manage uh, going into winter with a cow that's in really good shape, you can cut back a little bit, but you never want that cow to below, be below a body condition score of three. I've thrown a lot of information at you uh, tonight. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help or talk to people that are able to provide you with information, be it uh, a nutritionist, a, a feed, uh, feed company representative, and they get the answers for you. Veterinarians will help you as much as they can. And if you're lucky enough to be from Saskatchewan or Manitoba or British Columbia, you still have extension services available to, to provide information as well. Any questions? Sandeep, this is where I need you to kick in and help me out. Yes, yeah, uh, actually you can 
the participants they can type their question in the chat room there they can click on the chat and they can type the question okay i don't have that uh, capability on this screen to see the questions so if yeah, there is I, something can you yeah, read them out to me please yeah i haven't got any question yet okay while we're waiting for questions i i like to throw in a joke a young bull and an old bull are standing up on top of the hill. The young bull being eager and, and willing looks across the, the valley and sees the neighbor's heifers in the, in the valley below. So his thought was to run down across the, across the fence and breed a few of them. The, bull, the old bull with his wisdom says, no, let's walk down there and breed them all. So when they get to the fence, the young bull being agile and nimble, he jumped the four wire barbed wire fence and uh, goes over and starts courting the heifers. The old bull being a little bit more arthritic and crippled up, he couldn't jump the fence, so he tries crawling through. And unfortunately, halfway through uh, this procedure and getting through the fence, he lost his essential equipment on the barbed wire. Now he's just a consultant. I see there's a Q&A. Okay, the first question from Cindy is, uh, where can a person buy straight vitamin E? The, uh, the product is in short supply because China has been placed under quarantine and the product is not available as uh, readily as it was last, or, uh, you know, before the burning of the plant in Germany. So uh, just to have to look, I know that, uh, I can do this now because I'm not with the government. Uh, I know that uh, Alliance Seed Cleaning Plant usually has a reasonably good supply. You're going to have to just call and talk to Peggy about that. Uh, other feed mills, they do have it available, but be careful. There's two different products. One's at 500,000 IUs per day or per kilogram, and the other one is... Uh, 50,000. The one you want for farm is to use the 50,000. Second question is, do you have to roll peas when you're feeding cows? If your peas in the ration are less than 25% of the total grain portion, typically the cows are able to chew them and break them up into adequate uh, uh, you know, all they have to do is break the skin or the hull on the peas. Once both halves are exposed, they will be digested. Now, if you see that there's peas in the manure, what I would suggest is put on a rubber glove or some sort of glove and uh, see if it's just the hull that you're finding in the manure or if there's actually something left in the uh, in the in the in the manure so be careful to uh, uh, you know if you do find that you're having the amount of peas coming through hole then you are going to have to roll them but the problem there is peas tend to be no different than a ball bearing and uh, roller efficiency can drop fairly substantially if the rollers aren't set properly you don't have to push them much all you have to do is crack the hull. You don't have to squash them. Now, I did see that there was a question that was there and disappeared. Uh, yep, okay. The other one, with, would spring thrashed wheat be a viable option if barley's not available? Yes, wheat is an option. Probably a bigger discount for wheat with uh, being a feed quality. Again, the big thing that you have to watch for is wheat should not be cracked more than into two pieces. You, all you want to do is break the kernel in half. Uh, with, with wheat typically being dry or barley being dry in the spring, uh, you don't want to pulverize it and make it into pig feed. That's the only thing that is different. Just have to be a little bit more cognizant of what it looks like. 
wheat will typically have that 13, 14% protein. So uh, that, that's, that's good. The other thing is maximum of six pounds of wheat per day uh, to, a, to a mature cow, three pounds to a 700 pound feeder. And that's just because uh, of that rapid digestion rate and, and the risk of acidosis or grain overloads. All right, any other questions? Uh, uh, excuse me, Barry, you got another question in the chat room and it says that does high sodium water affect the salt intake required by the cows? Should water be tested? Water definitely should be tested if you find your cows are not eating as much salt free choice as you want. When your sodium content is above 300 parts per million or milligrams per liter, that is the point where they get enough sodium uh, to meet their requirements. Now, sodium makes up 39% of the weight of salt. So if you do have that high sodium water, yes, their free choice intake will be down. The other thing with water, and this is again, work out of Saskatchewan, uh, when they tested dugouts, almost 50%, and this was two years ago when it was dry and, and didn't have much runoff and there wasn't much refill, the sulfur content in the water, 50%, of the samples were submitted were high in sulfur, high enough to cause, uh, to potentially cause polio problems. So, you know, it's not just the well water that should be looked at. Uh, I'd also be looking at testing the dugouts, especially uh, once you get into July, into August when levels are down and there's been a lot of evaporation and, and not much refill. Any other questions? Uh, did you answer this one? A water belly in stairs is silicone in oats holds a possible cause or more about mineral imbalance? Urinary calculi is, uh, is due to a mineral imbalance, definitely. Um, It's something I haven't really touched much in the last five or six years. So off the top of my head, I can't uh, answer the question properly. But what we will do here is uh, just to minimize this, is whoever asked that question, you can see my email address there, BJ Uremcio. Uh, send me an email tomorrow and I will answer that question and, uh, and get back to you. One thing I do know is that when uh, urinary calculi is a problem, acidification will help uh, dissolve the calcium as, um, crystals. So uh, um, ammonium chloride is often used as a way to acidify the urine and, and help reduce the problem. So Mary, I got another question on my cell phone. Yeah, so, sure. So I get mineral in bulk. How long does vitamins keep value? <sighs> According to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, minerals should be consumed within six months of manufacture. That's the legal answer. If you're storing the mineral in a place where it is reasonably cool, away from the uh, uh, sun, it can last longer than that, but you will see a slight degradation or loss of activity after six months. It might take a year before you lose 50% of the vitamins. And yet on the other hand, if you're storing it in a uh, metal shed, a machine shop or a shed that's uh, warm, uh, the small 
2,000 bushel uh, steel bins uh, were the worst with bagged mineral, where it basically turns into an easy bake oven during the summertime, your vitamins could be gone as early as, as three months. Keep it cool, keep it dry. That's probably the best way to, to do it. And another question, uh, where can a person buy straight vitamin E? Seems very hard to find. Yeah, uh, talk to the feed mills, talk to your feed suppliers. Um, they can special order it in. Again, if you're having troubles, drop me an email. I'll, I'll see what I can do, depending on where, where you're located in the province or, or uh, you know, wherever you are. So again, um, in this Stetler area, the one place I found that typically has a good supply is the Alliance Seed Cleaning Plant. Okay, another one. What causes edema in bread hyphers? Oh boy. Do you want me to Google it? <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, edema is a swelling of tissues, if I remember correctly. Again, something that I really haven't seen much about and haven't had. Uh, um, much to do with over the years. Some people say it's a, a lack of iron, but with the forages and, and grains that we have in this part of the world, there's more than enough iron in the feeds to, to, to uh, meet that requirement. What else did you find there? <coughs> I think... Uh... I think we are pretty much caught up with the questions. I haven't got yeah. uh, any new question in the window. Okay. The gentleman or who uh, asked the edema question, again, drop me a line uh, to my G Gmail account and I will get back to you. Okay. I think it's from, okay. Yeah. I will, I will send you the contact information. All right. So, um, Cleo, I appreciate the opportunity to get in front of the crowd and, and provide this information in, in this time of uh, the coronavirus and not being able to stand up in front of the crowd. This is, I guess, the, is, is the best we can do right now. So um, if anybody has more questions or uh, need for information, don't be afraid to drop me an email. That's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me right now. Uh, actually, uh, very actually, uh, we are very thankful to you. Actually, you know, you make a history today. This is the first time we are, you know, organizing this type of webinar. We also never done it before, and uh, uh, thanks a lot. And then, and uh, I'm gonna, you know, ask one more time from the the participants if they have any questions. You know, they can they can type in, and if they don't have any question, then we can, you know conclude the, the webinar then. So yeah, I haven't got any a new question yet. So I think it's pretty good. So thanks a lot everybody for joining us and thanks a lot for your time, Barry, to share your knowledge with us. And uh, within a couple of days, we're gonna put this recording on our website and you can access this webinar uh, on our website as well. Thanks, thanks a lot, have a good night. Good night, everybody.